Um, all right, so let's get started. Thank you, everybody. Hello and welcome to Phosphorus Live. This is our bi-weekly look at the very interesting world of XIoT, the extended internet of things. I'm your host, Mike Huckabee. I'm head of go-to-market enablement here at Phosphorus, and I'm joined by our device-obsessed director of sales engineering, James McCarthy, who you're just chatting with. Hi, James. Hey, everyone. We're happy to have you join us. We get together like this every two weeks to provide education on the connected devices that we all use to run our businesses on these days and to give some insights into what Phosphorus does to help keep those devices secure. Format is simple, quick discussion on a specific topic, and then a Phosphorus technical take related to that topic. It's a quick hit, less than 30 minutes. We'll allow for some Q&A at the end and you'll be on your way. And the topic for today is oh, too many devices scaling to secure and manage XIoT. But before that, uh, hey, James, what's been happening at the XIoT news desk? Yeah, absolutely. This one uh, hits a little close to home for me because I, I'm obviously uh, really into the home automation stuff. I, I, if, a, if something I'm buying has an app, uh, I, I download the app inevitably and use it. I like having this that kind of connectivity, but that always comes with a trade-off, right? It comes with a, a security and, and privacy trade-off that we have to constantly evaluate as, as you know, people in the world today. Uh, and so the, the item I wanted to talk through today was a vulnerability that was recently um, you know, disclosed by Kia, the, the car manufacturer, uh, after an independent researcher had discovered a vulnerability uh, in their remote connections to the Kia uh, cars in the world. Uh, and it affected uh, virtually any Kia in the marketplace that had that kind of remote connectivity. Uh, but Kia announced that basically the vulnerability has already been remediated, but it highlighted for me the inherent risk that we have associated with everything in our lives being IP enabled, right? In this case, what happened was an attacker was actually able to leverage or take advantage of the APIs that were used by Kia dealerships. And it would allow them to actually access the remote functions that all Kias are sold with now, right? So you could start the engine, unlock or lock the doors, uh, or even accessing the internal and external cameras live as somebody's mm -hmm. using the car, right? Um, and so for me, that's that's like, hey, having somebody being able to access, that's kind of scary, but there's yeah. kind of two things that came from that. One is the attacker really only needed access to a license plate. All they had to do is know the license plate number or a VIN number, which again, you can see pretty easily on a car. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that basic information, they were able to take advantage of a flaw in the APIs that dealerships use to register accounts. So what they, the attacker could do is literally register themselves as, a, as an authorized user on a person's account, which now exposes all of that person's personally identifi identifiable information, but it also allows the attacker to go in there and uh, access the car and, and change functions wow. on the car. And for me, it was like, you know, I, we kind of, we always think about these IP enabled things and we understand mm -hmm. that there's risk associated with the fact that they're IP enabled, right. but we don't, we, we always think of the, the risk or the vulnerability or the flaw being on the device itself. But sometimes that that the flaw is actually on the server infrastructure or the way a company decides to implement their APIs. And right. in, in this case, that's what happened, right? You didn't actually have to take advantage of the device itself, or in this case, the car. Right. All you had to do is take advantage of the way the dealerships interacted with those cars. Uh, and so, uh, do you have a oh. do you have a smart car? You have something that uh, that might yeah. be remotely accessible? Well, Al, I, uh, I I drive a Tesla, so. There you go. So yeah. you're always trying to worry about that because that is just a computer on wheels, in which case, yeah. you know, the idea of somebody actually doing something to be able to either take over a function or to do something in the middle of the driving is, is definitely scary. I always try to think about what 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 is I guess we always trying to balance the level of risk. How much risk is it yeah. and what's the level of effort to kind of go through it and try to balance it out? Um, I, I think. It would be interesting for manufacturers, especially of devices like that, to start saying, here are your list of, you know, cybersecurity uh, checklists that you should have and make sure you check these off to make sure that you continue to be secure. But you never know when there's going to be a bug in, in firmware. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. That's, that's super interesting. Super interesting. 
Um, and I think all of us, because no matter what, I, all compute, all new cars are all connected. Um, they are. And all right, let me pull up presentation. You see that? Okay, James. Coming through well. All right. So, like I said, our topic for today is to put not another device. Um, the 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 challenge of scaling to secure and manage XIoT devices. But so, hey, James, do you remember even remember a world without IoT? Um, I, I, no. it seems like, you know, if, it's like been with me forever now. So what, what was the first IOT device you remember either seeing or using? Gosh, yeah, I, if I'm thinking back the first time I ever had something that was IP connected, that wasn't my computer, uh, was probably a camera that we had set up. It was like an IP camera, uh, that we were using because we had a, a pet, uh, at the home that we wanted to monitor at all times. Uh, but at the time, it was kind of in the early days of those those kind of IP cameras for home use, and it was still this huge behemoth device. Because uh, even back then, cameras themselves were you know large, large devices. Uh, and I remember it took us a long time uh, to get that thing connected because we had to go out and we had to buy a router, we had to do all this because we didn't have that infrastructure at the time uh, in the house. So it was a whole whole process. You know. Wow! Wow! And now we make it so easy today. Uh, for me, I had a buddy. And or it was actually a work colleague and we were together and he got a phone call from his daughter saying, hey, can you let me in the house? And I said, what? And he got on his computer and remotely opened the doors at his house. And this is the late 2000s. And I was just thinking, oh, my gosh, the, the, the idea of that. And you actually are sitting here next to me, actually unlocking the door from your house 30 miles away so your daughter could get in. Um, um, so I, th I think that's the first time, at least, that I remember seeing something that was XIOT. Now, I, I think it's commonly accepted that the first IoT device was this Sunbeam internet connected toaster. Um, however, I think that there's there's an argument that 10 years earlier than that, or more than that, 15 years earlier than that, um, the first real network connected embedded device type of thing was a Coca-Cola machine. And it was at Carnegie Mellon. And what happened there was there were some students, group of grad students, if I get the story correct, um, that used to have to walk a long way to get Cokes. They didn't know if, one, there were enough Cokes in the machine, or if they were cold, if they'd just been restocked, then they may be warm. So this group of students decided, hey, let's try to figure out if we can remotely monitor it. And they put in a board that monitored the lights on it. So when the lights were, um, uh, every single time you took out a Coke, the light would flash. So they would be able to count the lights. And then also when there was nothing in it, a different light would be on so that they would be able to see when it was actually empty. Um, and so they started monitoring. So that's arguably, I guess that's that's what that's a lot of people call it the first real IoT device. So So that was the start years and years ago. And now the number of devices have grown like crazy. And how many installed XIoT devices do you even think there are today? Well, um, this is a fun kind of graphical representation of the security challenge around different digital assets in the world. So starting there at the very top, if you look at the cloud of and the, the focus on cloud security, you think about all of the, the, the cloud servers that are in the world today owned by AWS and Azure and the like, about 10 million servers. And that's about eh, half or so of the number of horses that are in the world, if you wanna get, balance it out that way. And if you look at the, the security concerns around endpoint devices, anything that has a keyboard, all of those workstations that we have, there's about 5 billion globally. Well, there's about 8 billion people in the world. So we're still not even, cat. we're trying to catch up to the number of people, but it's, it's, uh, it's still a little bit ways away. Then when you come to XIoT and being able to think about how you secure those devices, there's about 50 billion installed XIoT devices worldwide is kind of the estimate. 47 to 50 is what I was last looking at. Um, across all of those types of devices. Well, that's the same number of birds that are estimated in the world, 50 billion birds in the world. So every time you see a bird, you could think, okay, one more XIOT device. 
new bird comes around, probably a new XIOT device. But this is kind of a uh, a good way of being able to sense, get a sense of the scope and the scale that's needed to actually secure this environment. And it's a huge jump in what we've been doing in the past. And so it seems overwhelming. And me, as a security person, it seems massively overwhelming. And just like Captain Kirk and the Tribbles, if any of you guys remember that old episode, I feel like I'm going to suffocate as the devices multiply just like those cute little creatures. Now, most organizations, they get the task and they go, they say, hey, hey, you, go secure all those devices to probably one person. So how can one person actually do this? So many people say, oh, yeah, you can go take care of the all the IoT devices, all the cameras and all the door controllers and everything else. Um, we're going to combine it under one security person to manage the whole thing. It just it massively just makes my mind blown. And so how can that one person even do this? If you even just think about the big questions they might have, first and foremost, where are my devices and what are they? Okay, that seems like if I'm talking 50 billion devices worldwide, that's a pretty astronomical number. And then even if I do find them, how do I know where I'm at risk or what I'm at risk for and what way do I do that? And if I have thousands of devices, how do I boil that down to something that I think could be actionable? And even if I do come to a point that actionable, once I know my risk, how do I go out and fix those things? And if I'm talking about thousands of things again, the effort around doing that, having a person go to fix a device, again, seems like an astronomical challenge that, that, that we all have to put up to this. So the biggest challenge that I see in our industry today as we look at XIOT is we have to build the right solutions so that this single person can act like an army of people to get the security on these devices right. And, and as we know, security has layers and solutions have to play nice within all of those layers. You have to find the right operational mix of technologies to be able to find and fix and manage all of these devices. So as we look at that individual person out there, we know we have these tasks that we have to get to, to, get to. We know now the, the, that organizations are gonna be requiring of us to provide the solutions that are gonna be safe and efficient to be able to help them with this incredible challenge that they have. So now you think, okay, well, what, what can we actually do? So let's head over to our technical tape um, and how we could actually approach this. So let me hand it over to James um, to talk a little bit about um, the phosphorus yeah. angle on this. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to actually pull up our platform here because I'm going to I'm going to talk through it and uh, also show uh, what we're what we're talking through here. And so, uh, like you said, the, the scale of the problem is, is really a, a big part of of uh, what companies and, and organizations struggle to solve, right? They, 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 you know, if they understand the risk or they understand the problem, uh, they often look at it as a uh, untenable or too big of a problem to actually try and solve in a meaningful way. Um, and the other approaches that have existed in the market can can sometimes get you, uh, you know, a lot of the way there, but not all the way. And so for for us, it, it's there's a, there's a couple really cool things that can happen when you start talking about how we can s discover things at scale and the kind of context we can provide. But also that last piece of the journey, which is how do we fix all of the things that we're helping illuminate in an environment? And how do we, do, again, do that through the lens of scale uh, in, 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 you know, in a meaningful way, right? How do we make the people that you already have today employed in your organization more productive uh, with when it comes to your IoT um, you know, infrastructure? And so there's a couple of things I want to talk through. So first and foremost is the concept of discovery, right? How do we find these things in a meaningful way at scale, but how do we more importantly continue to have that experience, continue to find the new things that get onto your network and can continue to be thorough? Because what, what's great about Phosphorus is, you know, historically platforms, you know, when, when you think about doing something like an NMAP or a Tenable or some other kind of scan at scale, the, the efficiency of that is, is so poor that doing it with any regularity 
is not really an option, right? Most organizations would take one of those things, do it as a point in time scale or scan one time a year, or they do it quarterly as some sort of audit, right? Um, but because they're so slow and they impact the network in such a great way, you don't do it with any frequency. And for us, that's, that's where we start to kind of diverge and say, okay, it's important to discover your devices, but let's do that a little bit more often, right? Because we can do it fast and we can do it efficiently. We send very little data on the networks. We're not interrupting operations uh, and we're doing it uh, so quickly that doing something like maybe a weekly scan of your environment is actually a reasonable thing to do. Uh, and so what we can do here in the platform is one person can log in to the account or to the system here and just do a weekly uh, you know, discovery for all IoT, right? And now we can go in here and just repeat that, that scan and have it run, say, you know, weekly, monthly, daily, whatever it is you want to do, uh, we can go in here and support that. So we can say Thursdays. Uh, and we can even go in and, and create like an advanced cron job. So you can get really granular with the frequency that you do that discovery. And so the idea behind that is just saying, look, because we're so fast and efficient, we can go out there, find these things as the as they change, because inevitably from one week to the next, especially in the large organizations, they're going to be adding devices all the time. They're even going to be taking devices offline. Or in the case of companies who do you know, M&A, they go out and acquire another business or they, they merge you know, business units having this ability to go in there and see what's in that business unit uh, you know, on a regular basis is, is pretty powerful. So that's the first step. Let's find those things at scale. Let's do this in an automated fashion with some form of regularity so that we can keep our, ourselves efficient. The next thing I wanna talk through is, is how do we then, once we've found these things, how do we then keep track of and kind of keep tabs on those devices uh, in terms of evaluating their you know, risk posture or evaluating their configurations, right? And that's where having some, some kind of recurring interrogation process can be really helpful because the idea is we went out and found these devices, but as things you know, go with, with IoT, they change, they shift, they move, all sorts of things happen all the time. And so it's important to have a regular or recurring interrogation as well, which is basically telling our platform to go out to all of your things and on a regular basis, and this might be something you do weekly or, or even more often than that, and just say, hey, go out and talk to each one of those devices and check the status of their configuration. Did the firmware get changed out of band? Did somebody change a credential the, the, you know, when they shouldn't have? Or maybe did somebody enable SSH on a camera that wasn't enabled before, right? Now, all of a sudden, you've got a slight shift in the risk profile of that device and having that regular interrogation uh, running on those devices can help uh, you know, illuminate that when it happens. And so now what you've done is again, with just the simple coming in here and creating a single recurring you know, interrogation job, um, that one person that, or that team can go in there and have this kind of current uh, ongoing uh, you know, view into the risk posture mm -hmm. of their devices and know that it's, and it's, that it's fairly up to date, right? All right. And then the last thing I think is, is really where things, I think, get interesting because most organizations don't patch. They don't do all of this kind of hygiene that we you know, think they need to be doing, uh, that they have to be doing because it, it, it's such a big problem. Uh, and it's so hard to tackle that they either don't have enough human resource uh, to accomplish that um, or the humans that they do have in place to do these things don't have the necessary tools to do that in a meaningful way. Uh, and so for, for us, we can go in here and if we click on uh, install firmware, this brings up uh, what we call our, our campaign system. But the idea behind this is how do we kind of, how do we keep that um, you know, hygiene level as high as we can without requiring a huge army of people to go out and do things on a regular basis? So we can just go, uh, we can just, let's call this um, updates or we'll do uh, weekly updates or something, right? Uh, but we can go in here and what's really cool is we can either use a saved query. So if we've already kind of created this, this concept of, hey, here are the devices that I care about that I want you know, to keep kind of N minus one or, or, or N zero in terms of how updated they are. Um, or we can just do a device search right here in the UI. Uh, so what I like to do is I, I'll say, hey, like let's look at manufacturer uh, and do access. Uh, you know, these are all of our, all of our cameras. Uh, and you know, things like maybe the access door controllers or whatever it is, but I can look at this in the lens of a manufacturer. Uh, and with just one query here, what I can do is I can say, 
update all new and existing devices to the latest firmware version. And what's great and really, really cool about this is now I can, I can do one of two things. I can either say, hey, just by default, anything that's an access camera, just if, if a new update's available and Phosphorus has that capability to go in and update that device, just do it, right? As soon as you detect that that device is out of date, get that thing current, right? So now we've got this kind of automated or, or at least semi-automated you know, uh, uh, hygiene lift, in at least in this manufacturer's case. Or what we can do is go in here and uncheck that. And I can go and say, all right, so for all of my door controllers, you know, maybe we don't want to be on the latest version, right? Maybe we want to be N minus one, or we want to have that kind of granularity. We can actually specify that here uh, in, in the UI. And as you can see, we even have the option to downgrade, right? But the idea behind this is, you know, we're, we're taking action at scale across an entire fleet of devices. Now, do we say or recommend you guys doing that uh, to all of your IoT at all times and having it just be fully automated? Probably not, right? There's a lot of different uh, levels of risk associated with different device families. Uh, and so it's good that you know, the platform can help you be more granular, uh, but it becomes that force multiplier for your, your staff uh, to be able to do these things in a meaningful way at scale. And that's, uh, that's that for, for my talk track there, Huck. Uh, what, what do you think about um, specifically with the firmware? Uh, you know, is this something that you've talked to customers and, and had a good experience with? Is this something that you're seeing being leveraged in the wild? Yeah, definitely. And one, I think one of the questions that I, I get frequently is because there's so much firmware that's out there is how do you keep up with all the firmware um, that is out there in the first place. So how, how do I, how can I rely on you phosphorus to make sure that you giving me all of the latest data? What's your response mm -hmm. to that? Yeah, th that's actually one of, one of the many superpowers that I think we have here at phosphorus. And, and you know, th so the answer to that is that it's going to vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? Because not all uh, manufacturers are created equally. Uh, some of them are really, really good at publishing their firmware day one, great documentation, uh, and they're really good at not introducing bugs, so it's very simple. Uh, we can do that automatically, right? We just read that from the manufacturer, we import it, and we're, we're good to go. Other manufacturers might be a little bit more difficult, right? They, they might require a little bit more manual intervention or you know, manual tracking. Uh, but what's great is we've built on, on, on the back end all of the process and, and you know, um, um, capability to do this at scale across all of the manufacturers that we support uh, out, out of the box. And so as we go in and add a new manufacturer to, to enable the you know, firmware upgrades, um, we build that into that kind of process and that, that pipeline so that as they come out with new things and as things change, we're, we're, we're grabbing that automatically. And then what's great is we keep that in perpetuity. Uh, we become the CDN for our customers. So the firmware is coming from our infrastructure, not the manufacturers. Uh, and as part of that process, and this is the key here, mm -hmm. we're validating the actual hash of the file because what we don't want is for a customer to accidentally yeah. install firmware that's been compromised out of the box. Very nice. Um, I, I one other question, but I want to open it up to uh, our audience. If you have a question for us based on today's topic or anything else having to do with phosphorus, um, you can type in your question in the Q&A section into um, uh, in, into Zoom, we'll go from there. But so the other thing that is a common question, um, James, that I hear was just about, okay, if you're doing all these things and doing all these things at scale, it's a, it's a lot of numbers to process, but I typically then need to give a report back. I need to be able to let my business know that the issue that, you know, that everybody sees about managing this level of devices, then how, how can, how do I make sure that there's relevant information that's getting back into like leaders in the business. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, that's that's where a lot of our reporting can come in handy because what we're doing is we're showing, you know, the the progress as as we go through and do these big upgrades, you know, in terms of fixing or remediating issues, mm -hmm. we're showing the progress of that through our reporting. Um, but the the first step in that scenario is almost always going to be showing or or sharing the risk, right? Showing the detailed right. information about these devices. Uh, and then tracking those changes over time, right? And that's something that our reporting can help with. We also integrate with you know uh, other third parties. So you can take the data and the information that we're providing and put it into another platform 
uh, you know, like your your, right. your SIM or or some other inventory tracking tool. Uh, so the the data that we're producing becomes an enabler for you know kind of that executive level view into an environment, uh, and we're, we we have really really good data that we can share uh, across the board for that. Perfect. I think you answered question that I know that we got in, which is, hey, if things change um, inside of the environment when you scan, can I um, uh, can, can I send my alerts to my SIM, which I think you just yeah. you just answered. Yeah, absolutely. And we track that, right? So if, if a device, you know, if we, if we see a device on firmware version A uh, today, and then we go out and scan it tomorrow, and you know, somebody went out and upgraded that device or changed the firmware in some way mm -hmm. without going through the proper channels of phosphorus, uh, then we detect that. And we actually alert on that activity and say, hey, this device has, has changed since the last time we saw it. Uh, but because we didn't do the change or somebody didn't use us, uh, that mm -hmm. becomes an alert, right? If it gets uh, unplugged and plugged back in and it loses all of its settings, we detect that kind of activity as well. Uh, the paperclip attack is, a, is kind of a, the, the common use case there. Uh, where somebody might hard reset a device so that they can go in and uh, and take advantage of the default credential, things like that. Perfect. Paperclip attack for everybody is take a paperclip, put it into the little hole in the back of the device and it resets it back to manufacturer settings. And uh, that's the thing we got to prevent against. All right. A any other questions out from the audience right now? Okay, we're coming right up on the time. Just to be able to leave you with a couple of, of additional thoughts. One, the, the Phosphorus platform is, is designed to help with this massive challenge of being able to manage all these devices at scale um, uh, across the board. And we're always happy to be able to get engaged with you, to be able to give you a little bit more deeper insight than what we may have shown today. Um, as we like to say, We've got this challenge out there, the 153060 challenge. Give us 15 minutes. Give us to, to, to start finding all the devices. Give us 30 minutes. We'll show you how we can start um, hardening those devices. And in 60 minutes, we can show you how we can start remediating issues on those devices. Uh, we're always here to help with device and uh, with, with James and his device obsession. We're we're ready to help you on any devices you have. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. We'll be back in two weeks. We're um, we're probably going to do something that has to do with integration with the technology partner, um, but uh, we will look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everybody.